Hello, so in the last video what we did is we had a look at a woodcutter AI using a finite state machine. I'm not sure if my implementation of a finite state machine was the correct way to do it or, or the industry standard or anything like that, but the basic principle was there and that's for the finite state machine to move on from one state to the next, like to move from um, moving to a tree, to facing a tree, to harvesting the tree, to waiting for it to fall, you have to explicitly declare those transitions. You can't just let the, the, the system do it for you intuitively based on where they are hierarchically like you do in code, right? Like in code, let's have a look at that. As we know, if you've been programming for a little while, you'll know that code activates things in a sort of hierarchical fashion. This will be initialized first, then that will be initialized, and then these will be initialized, and then finally this method, it will go through this method here. So we'll do things step by step. And you know that beginner programmers soon find this out because if this method relied on some variable that was initialized here, which it does, um, it relies on this here. So let's say if I put this one below the method, I apologize if this is like describing the alphabet to you, but you know, you never know who's watching how new they are to programming. Then I'm going to get this problem. I'll get a null reference exception because it's saying, hey, there is no such thing as an equipment script. This, this method is being activated before that variable is initialized. So it goes down in this sort of linear hierarchical, I'm not sure what the exact, you know, the technical term for this sort of operation is, but that's what's happening anyway. So that won't be a bug anymore. Right, well, what Eric did, Eric uh, is the guy who developed this Panda BT system we're using today, is he thought, well, that's really elegant, and it's, um, oh, <laughs> that's going crazy. <laughs> he said, that's really elegant. Uh, why, why can't AI work like that as well? And then we can go, all I have to do, if I wanted to add something in between um, facing the tree and harvesting the tree, or if I wanted to add something between um, going to the destination and dropping the log, I wouldn't have to do anything except put another uh, method in between those two. In fact, I did that just before when I realized I had to make the unit stand up. So I just put this there. It was that simple. And that's why this approach to AI is so scalable, it's so intuitive, it's so easy to use in comparison to a finite state machine when you run into this nightmare of working out how one state is going to move to the next, how they're all going to transition. You get this insane cobweb of states which um, even with just one behavior, with my woodcutter behavior, many of you would have seen just how complex that was quickly becoming when I was nesting finite state machines and finite state machines, and it was really ugly. And in comparison, this is just really beautiful. Before I give you a demonstration of this AI, I want to show you how to download Panda BT. The folder that I've given you, the project I've given you, does not contain Panda BT, and the reason why is that even though Panda BT is free, um, it's still uh, an asset, and all assets have to be downloaded from the store. If you share an asset with someone else, even if it's a free asset, um, you're breaking Unity's terms and conditions, so keep that in mind. If you've got problems on the forums and you want to post this project, that's fine go to gamegrind.com or somewhere like that and post it, but do not include Panda BT. That, otherwise you're kind of, um, yeah, being naughty. Okay, so let me show you how to get this. Um, if you don't have an asset store tab, um, I'll just show you how to make one, just in case you don't know. Let's close that. Okay, let's go to Window, and we're going to add, I haven't done this for a while, oh yeah, it is Window, then add Asset Store there. And in the Asset Store, we're going to search we're going to search for Panda BT. Click on there. Now I already have this, so it's just import, but you'll need to download it and do all that sort of stuff. Yep, everything, why not? Yes. Okay, and now you'll see that all those errors have gone away because I had scripts which used um, Panda BT namespace and that's why I had those errors there. But we're not finished yet. So now we have our unit and... Oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> I thought this would be like a non-existent that we'd have to replace it and do all that sort of stuff, but we don't, which is great. Okay, that makes it easier for you guys. But I'm just going to play it really safe. Let's just pretend that you that that didn't work out so nicely. So then what we have to do is add 
panda bt, just go and search and add that. And then we have to add our behavior to that. So the behavior is stored, if you go down to scripts, it's in the panda bt folder. Go back to unit. And then just drag that into there. And there. Now we're on the same page again. I'll just quickly check. Actually, that, now's a good time to demonstrate the AI, just to make sure that everything works at this stage. OK, I'll just demonstrate the AI for you now. We'll press play. And here we go. We have the behavior tree here. And the nodes and the tasks are color coded. So blue means that it's currently running. So what is it? we start here with this um, tree that's running. And we go back into this fallback node. Now, behavior tree works using nodes and children of nodes. So trees, trees have nodes and nodes have children, right? So in this case, we've got this tree here. Then we've got this node called fallback. And then fallback has these two children, which are trees, which I think trees are also technically nodes as well. I'll have to double check that one. That's just a detail. So here in fallback, uh, now the way fallback works, children either succeed or they fail, much like in life. So we, <laughs> so we have here this tree uh, woodcutter. The fact that it's red means that it's failed. So it's gone into this tree here, woodcutter. And then it's got this node called a while node. Uh, I should have written this a little bit differently, just so it's easier to see. Let me just jump in here and change something very quickly. Yeah. OK. So the while node has two children. In this case, it's got this. And one of them has to be a Boolean variable. And this Boolean variable um, is either going to be true or false, as Booleans are. In this case, uh, it's saying while this Boolean variable is true. So if this Boolean variable is false, then this will fail. And therefore, the entire tree is going to fail here. So in a fallback node, if one of its children fails, then it moves on to the next one, right? That's how this works. A child fails, it moves on to the next child. So that's exactly what it's done here. It's gone into this woodcutter tree. It has this while node. And this while node only succeeds if this Boolean variable is true. But this Boolean variable is false. Therefore, this while node has failed. And this entire tree has failed, because it's sort of like the main node, as you can see. And now we move on. Now this fallback node says, OK, that's failed. Let's move on to the next to the next one, which is down here. So the idle tree also has this while node. And this while node, just like before, is succeeds when its Boolean variable, this one is Boolean child, is true. And in this case, is idle is true, as you can see on the task unit task script, is idle is true. So incidentally, all these things, these Boolean variables, is idle, and is woodcutter, and all of these methods here, um, like you know, harvest object and go to destination, find source, stand around, they are all stored on this unit task script, and I'll show you that in a second. But for now, I'll try and, I'll try and explain the logic of how this works. Um, so right, so at the moment, is idle is true. So this while node is succeeding. That's all good. Now a while node has two children. If you have more children than that, it will break and send an error message because it can only deal with two. One of the children is the Boolean variable, which determines whether or not the while node is succeeding or failing. Um, the second one is the action child, which tells, which is what you do when this is true, basically, right? So basically, what I want, let's, I'll just say in basic English of what I want to happen when the person is an idle. I want two possible things to happen. If there's nowhere for the guy to sit, I just want him to stand around like this. But if there is a place for him to sit, then I want him to sit on the stool. I want him to prioritize sitting on the stool over standing around, which I think, you know, to me makes sense. So then how do you translate that behavior into a panda bee tree, the panda behavior tree? This is how I did it. Um, so I have this while node is idle. That's like the overarching um, thing that keeps this all going. Uh, as soon as this is false, you exit out of all of this, irrespective of what's happening in the fallback node, OK? Um, now, this fallback node, like I said before, this one has two children, but a fallback node can have more than two children. As far as I'm aware, it can have as many children as you want. Uh, but if that's not true, I'll correct it in the next video. Annotations are being removed from YouTube pretty soon, which is terrible, because I, re I really rely on annotations for when I stuff up or say things incorrectly, make mistakes, I can put an annotation there, but soon I won't be able to do that. 
So I'll have to make correction videos or something. All right, so uh, in this, this fallback node, as I said before, it goes through children when one of them fails. Now, the opposite to a fallback node is the sequence node, which we'll get to very soon. We'll get to imminently, in fact. And a sequence node goes through its children only when one of them succeeds. So if find Sewell succeeded, then it would go on to go to destination, go on to face interactable, only if that succeeded, until it got to sit on the stool. Right? So that's how a sequence node works. A, a fallback node is like the opposite of that, and it only moves through its children when one of them fails. So, okay, this failed. Why did this fail? Right? So there's this method in here called find stool. And what that's doing, I'll show it to you. Um, it is not there, it's there. Right, so find stool. And then all I did to make this a panda BT method is put task on the top. Well, I am using the panda namespace. God, this is a long script. I'm going to minimize some of this stuff. Right, so find stool is a task now. That's something which, if you don't have task there, let's just see what, let's just see what happens. And I encourage you to learn by breaking things. It's a great way to learn coding is just by breaking it. You'll get an error and it will say, ah, oh, find stool is not defined. This is invalid behavior tree because now it doesn't recognize it. The only way to, to make this a method that uh, PandaBT can use is to have a task at the top of the method and now we're good to go again. Right, so what, what is this doing? What this is doing is it's having a look at a script I have. It's, um, it's a singleton script because it's only going to be one of them. It's a manager script. And this script simply stores all of the interactable game objects that I'm going to have that are added during runtime or there at start. And, um, right now, it doesn't, it doesn't support items that are there at start, but it does do it for when you add them at runtime. It's quite an easy fix to include items that are there at start as well. Right, so what it's doing is it's checking all the stools that are in the world. If, it's saying if, if there's more than zero stools in the world, um, then find that stool and set it as your destination for pathfinding and all that kind of stuff. And this node has succeeded, right? This, this is this node, rather this child has succeeded. However, if there is, if there is zero stools in the world, then this child has failed. And that's how you say, that's how you set the conditions for success or fail. I'll just run through that again. It's checking all the stools in the world. If it's saying if there's more than zero stools, then find that stool and then this child has succeeded. If there are no stools in the world, then this child has failed. Okay, so as you see, it's gone red, right? Because there are no stools in the world, and if you don't believe me, have a look at the interactables manager. Uh, there's four trees, there's no, and there's no stools, right? So size zero, and that's what's happening there. Um, right. But as we also saw in that same method, then if there is more than zero stools, then this child has succeeded and importantly stand around has failed because stand around will fail if you've got more than zero stools in the world so simultaneously uh, this one will well not simultaneously but this one will fail and then the fallback node okay okay wow that child failed i better go and check to see what the other child is doing but now this one's going to succeed because that's the condition when there are no stools in the world this one is going to be fine it will just be running right as soon as there's stools in the world, this one's going to fail. And this one is going to succeed. So let's, let's stop yabbering on about it and actually put a stool into the world. Now, it's gone green. And as you can see, it goes green sequentially down like that. Because as, each, as this succeeds, then the sequence says, OK, good, that succeeded. Move to the next one. That succeeded. Move to the next one. That succeeded. Now move to the next one. Remember, green is a sign that this has succeeded. Right, so now we're just sort of sitting in this sit stool method where nothing much is happening there, as far as I remember. If you're sitting on the stool... Ah, so all I'm doing in that method is I'm setting um, sitting to true. That's an animation thing. And then if not idle, sitting is set to false. But I don't think that works which is why I had to create that stand-up one. Basically, what I think happens is that it exits out. If is idle is set to false, it seems to exit out of this before that can actually be activated. So I don't think it, it works, so I, I might as well not even put it there at all. Okay, so he's sitting there now. And then, so what happens? Let's, let's build some stuff. Let's move on to the woodcutter state. 
to make the woodcutter boolean variable true what I have to do is two things one I have to have the unit selected and then I have to press woodcutter but he's like you expect me to work without pads oh there's also a <laughs> text out of range exception <laughs> he stands up like fully outraged <laughs> right so then in order for this to work you have to um, what's that all about uh, okay yeah, this has nothing to do with any of this stuff. This is a bug and yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, gotcha. But this is a bug that I haven't fixed yet because I've extended Sebastian Lake's pathfinding system. If you set as your target destination um, the very node that you're standing on, you get this bug. I just haven't got around to fixing it yet. I bet it's such an easy fix. I'll kick myself when I finally get around to it. But at the moment, in the projects that I've been releasing on YouTube, if you set as your destination the very node that you're standing on, you'll get this index out of range exception problem. Okay, that's just some information there about that. A lingering bug in my project files. Okay, so what he's trying to do is he stood up. Uh, okay, so I'll show you what happened there. He stood up and then he went to check for pants, but there was no storage facility which contained pants. So then what he's trying to do is he's trying to go back to this bench to sit down and sulk about it. But he can't because uh, of this bug. So he's just got you know, screwed over really badly. So what we have to do is build the stuff. We've got to build the chest of drawers, which contains the pants. We've got to build the weapons rack, which contains the axe. Now let's select him again and go, oh, oh it's a really bad bug. Oh, man, I've got to get around to fixing that. Let's try that again. Okay, here's a little stool. So I'm building a chest of drawers, which has the pants, a weapons rack, which has the axe, and then I'm also building a wood stockpile there. Let's have a look at the Panda BT. So far, is woodcutter is false. To make it true, okay, if you just click woodcutter, it will say, oh no, there's no unit selected. For this kind of game, in order for AI to work, you need to tell the system which units you're referring to. Otherwise, it, I, yeah, it just wouldn't work. Okay, now, is woodcutter is true? He gets his pants, he gets his axe, he goes to the nearest tree. So let's see what's happened so far. I won't go into as much detail as before. But let's just have a quick look. So is woodcutter is true? That's why that succeeded. Because this is true, this sequence is activated. Um, now this sequence, again, is the opposite to a fallback. And it goes through its children only when the children succeed. If a child fails, the entire sequence fails, right? Now, as mentioned before, a while node has a Boolean variable, or a Boolean child, and it has an action child. And the action child is all the things you want to have to happen, uh, you want to happen when this is true. So what I put there for the uh, child, the action child is another sequence node, which again, it's fine to have nodes as children. You can have nodes as children of nodes which are children and so on, um, you know, for as long as you like, really. Um, so then this sequence goes to stand up, and stand up makes him get up from that stool, and then it goes to the next sequence, which is the next child in this sequence, and that goes through check pants to see if you've got the right pants, um, if you do, great, success. Uh, if you don't, now this is this one here, so check your pants. If you don't have the right pants, then this child fails. And because we're dealing with a fallback node here, if that child fails, then it's going to move to the next child, which is the sequence for getting the pants that you need. Uh, you find the storage which has pants, you go to that storage, you face that storage, and you take the pants. That's, that's what this sequence is. Each child succeeding, leading to the next child, leading to the next child, and the next child, like that. Again, if this was true, I'm sorry, if this succeeded, if he did have the right pants and this succeeded, it wouldn't go to the sequence because we're dealing with a fallback, and a fallback is the opposite to a sequence. As soon as something fails, then it moves on to the next, but if this has succeeded, then it would exit out of the fallback. Right, so now he's gone and got all his gear using these methods here, using these trees, and now he's going to harvest wood, which is here. What happens here is that he finds the closest tree, that's what these two methods do, uh, it sets the comparison vector 3 there to some ridiculous value like 999, 999, 999, well exactly that value actually, uh, which you know is really far away. And then it uses that vector 3, which I have to reset here because that's how this method works in this one, is it uses that and changes it according to the one that's closer. Anyway, you can have a look at the script yourself and work out how, what's going on there. And then, um, so that's what this is doing, it's finding the nearest tree, which in this case will be there. If it goes there, there's something wrong. It goes to the destination, which that's blue, so that means it's running right now. And again, a sequence. Ah, 
but there's something I haven't covered yet. We've talked a lot about sequences and fallbacks and while, but this is another type of node. This node is called, well, a repeat node, and what that does is it runs through its child repeatedly until it fails. So this would just keep running. If there are a thousand trees on my scene, it would just keep running through that until all a thousand trees were destroyed. So he's currently walking towards his destination. When he gets there, he's going to turn to face the tree. Um, if I don't have that, when the person walks to an interactable, he'd just like, in this case, he'd be facing... Oh, I never eat soggy wheat bigs. <laughs> I'd, I'd still have to do that. He'd be facing west, right? Uh, but no, he wanted to be facing directly to the location to the south. Um, then he's going to harvest it. Let's have a look. Right, that's what he's done. He's harvested the tree, and now he's waiting for the tree to fall. Uh, there's a few reasons. If you don't have that there, then he just starts processing it immediately. So as the tree is falling down, he'll start chopping it to make a log, which is weird. But also, it, it interrupts with um, the sound the tree makes as it's falling. So as the tree falls, it goes, eh, then it hits the ground and goes, pshh. I think that's really cool. But when he starts chopping it, it interferes with that sound. So I don't want that to happen. He waits two seconds for the tree to fall. Now, eventually, this should be improved, not just to wait for some, you know, magic number like two seconds. You sh he should really do it when the tree actually falls. I think that'd be quite easy to set up. You could just have some Boolean variable which plays when the tree has fallen or something like that, which then tells him that he can start processing the tree. The reason I say that is that because physics is making this tree fall down, it could very easily become stuck on something or, you know, something could go wrong and it would take longer than two seconds for it to be completely on the ground. So, yeah, that's just for now, it's just it waits two seconds and then he starts processing it. Once he's finished processing it, it produces a log, which he then uh, picks up. So all this method does is it, it sets the um, animation, which is a trigger in this case, um, to pick up, pick up the animation. And then he collects the wood, sets destination back to the storage, um, so here, and then goes to the destination and deposits the log, and then it continues. This repeat node ensures that this will keep happening. So let's have a look at it. Processing it, picks it up, and deposits it, and it's got no material. Same thing. Now he's going to go back there, deposit the log. There are no more trees. And so off he goes to his little stool to sit down. The end. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to set you a kind of homework task, just because you're going to benefit a lot more from this, these tutorials if you jump in there and, and try and make your own behavior tree. So I'll tell you the things you need to know uh, to write your own behavior tree script, and I'll give you a task. So that's coming up right now. Okay, so the task I'm giving you is to use the behavior tree I've shown you in this video and use the assets and scripting system in this project to make your own behavior tree for a miner, right? So we've done a woodcutter behavior tree and now make one to go and harvest stone from the world. And graphically, what I've given you for that is a mining animation. Um, I haven't given you a stone stockpile, uh, but that would be you know, pretty straightforward to make yourself, I think. Um, they give you these different types of rock I've uh, given you a pickaxe, and I think that's it as far as the, the 3D assets go and animations go. And then as far as everything else goes, what you'd need to do is have a careful look at how this entire system works together. Examine all the scripts that are attached to um, any game object and use lots of debug statements and that sort of thing to sort of unpack and work out how this whole thing works. I, I'm a strong believer in doing that and gaining a deeper understanding of, of coding in general and sort of reverse engineering and problem solving. What I'm going to do, like, so really give that a strong attempt. What I'm going to do next week is upload a video about how I'd make a minor BT. 
So if you get really stuck, don't worry. Next week I'll be uploading a video about exactly how to do that. And it's going to be a different type of video. If you've seen my previous videos, you'll know that I don't like um, programming in real time. I like spending many hours making a project and then releasing the whole project for free online and then kind of giving you sort of an overview of how the whole thing works and what's going on. That's my preference. Um, but I think this time I'll make an exception because it, doing it in real time would really help you see how this whole thing works step by step, script by script, and also how the methods work and how they can be changed to accommodate new behaviors. So the next video will probably be quite a bit longer, but it's for people who really want to see how to do this step by step so everything is explained completely. I understand some viewers won't benefit from that as much, but if you're new to programming, then it, it should be really helpful for you. There's one thing I need to share with you though, and that's um, to get this here. In, in the scripting system that Eric created for Panda Behavior Tree, its indentation is extremely important, so that this syntax of indentation is crucial. When you make a node, like a while node, you have to ensure that the children are indented one space to the right. So if they're there, you'll get some crazy errors. And as far as I'm aware, if they're sort of halfway between like that, let's just see what happens if they're kind of not quite indented enough, if it throws an error. Yeah, no. Yeah, so you have to make, so the best way to see, and let's see if it's really sensitive. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, so then really you have to make, the best way to see if everything is lined up is to get this add-on. Because if it's off by one space, you're going to get errors and problems, and you'll be like, well, what's wrong? Like, everything's working accordingly, and this is like, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> Which would be quite, quite annoying to have to deal with. But this makes it extremely easy to see what's going on. So definitely get this one. I had no issues downloading this. I am using Visual Studio 2015. Um, and all I had to do to get this add-on was download that and press OK or something and it was there in the project. Everything has it. It shows you how to change it, how to turn it off and that sort of thing if you get sick of it. Um, but I think it's kind of an indispensable asset for this scripting language. So yeah, definitely get that one. Um, there's a lot more I could say about the project, about how you start off and that sort of thing. Um, but I encourage you just to jump into it, get stuck into it. The, the scripts that are most relevant for understanding how this works. Um, I should really put all in one folder, but they're obviously this one in the Panda BT one. The inventory stuff is relevant. This, the equipment script is relevant. Um, uh, the info panel is kind of, you can change, yeah, no, you don't really need that. Okay. Um, oh, wow, so much is relevant. And also there isn't, this isn't fleshed out yet. Okay, so I've set you quite a difficult task because I haven't really explained everything. And some of these, like the Boulder script and stuff, isn't really finished yet. But if you're feeling brave and you want to jump in, give it a shot. Even if you don't succeed, I mean, the process of unpacking this project and working out how it all you know, fits together and how it works um, should be quite an interesting uh, programming challenge for you. Uh, but by next Wednesday, there will be another one. Uh, I'll make another video explaining this step by step. So, you know, I hope you've benefited from this, from this tutorial and learned a bit about Panda VTs. If you're not really excited about this asset, then I've done something wrong because this is an extremely exciting asset. As a series, what I'm aiming for is to have a thriving town or village uh, of about 30 people who are all engaging in some kind of AI. Uh, think like Timber and Stone or Stone Hearth or something like that. Um, I've found playing those games quite a lot that a population of 30 can be quite fun, dynamic, and it's just enough people to be able to have what seems like a simulation of a town, but also it's not so many that you'd lose track of individual units. You can still gain a, a kind of an attachment to your individual units because it's um, not so many that you sort of, they just become numbers on a screen moving about here and there. They can have traits and personalities and idiosyncrasies and stuff, which creates more sort of emotional attachment. So I'm going for 30 units, A, because I think it's better, you know, because you can kind of become more familiar with your units and become attached to them and all sorts of things. and and see their idiosyncratic traits. But also for, you know, it's easier in terms of optimizing your game to aim for 30 units as opposed to like 200 or 300 units, which would be an optimizing nightmare. And is simply above my programming ability to try and manage something at that scale. Okay, so, you know, have fun playing around with this project and I'll see you guys next week for my real-time breakdown of a, a minor behavior tree. All right, take care.